Hey, welcome back everyone. In this video, we are going to write the code for an algorithm called is self describing number. This is an algorithm that I spoke about back at the beginning of the year and I described how it works in the previous video. So if you want to check that out, I'll link to it here. But in this video, we're actually going to code it. Just a quick example in case you don't have any reference from that previous video, this is how this algorithm is supposed to work. Basically, it's a function that takes in a number and then checks to see if the number is what is called self-describing and it returns true if it is and false if it is not. So what is a self-describing number? Well, I'll show you an example of a number that is self-describing and then we'll go ahead and write the code. So the first one is 1210. And so if you were to give indices to this like you would in an array, the first one is zero and then one and then two and then three. So each one of these numbers, or we'll call them elements, each one of these elements in this number has a corresponding index. Basically at the first one, the number is one and the index is zero. And so we say there should be one zero in this number. So if you look at one, two, one, zero, it has one zero, so that checks out. We go to the next index and we say, okay, there should be two of the number one. So two of the index one. So here's one, here's one, there's two ones so that checks out. So then you go to one and two. The number two is the index. That's the number that we're looking for. And there should be one of them. That's the corresponding element. So if we look at the number, of course, there's that two. There's only one two. So that checks out. And then three, there should be zero threes. There are no threes in this number. Therefore, this number is self-describing. So in these test examples here, I've got five uh, self-describing numbers that will return true, and then I've got four uh, ones that are not self-describing that will return false. So let's go ahead and write a function. So we're going to call this function is self-describing, and it's going to take one argument. We'll call that argument num. You could call it number also if you'd like. The first thing we want to do is take this num, which is an integer, and convert it into a data type that allows us to iterate over it. So the easiest thing to iterate over in this case is going to be a array. And unfortunately, there's no super simple way that I'm aware of to convert a number to an array. If you had like a string, some string, except that's not how you spell sum. So if you had some string and you want to convert it to an array, you just split it and then you decide how you want to split it on an empty string or on a space or a comma or, or a character. And that would give you some type of array of strings. So how do we take this number and convert it into an array? Because you can't convert like one, two, three, you can't split it. Split is specifically for strings. And you can see the linter here actually yells at you. Okay, so first of all, let's call the result of this num array. So the num array is going to be the result of converting this number that gets passed in to the function into an array. So we have the number, first thing we need to do is convert it to a string. So we'll take the string constructor and pass in num. And now that it gives us a string, we can call split on it. If you call split with no arguments, say for example, we have one, two, three, and then we convert it to a string. So now we have one, two, three, and you split it with no arguments. What you end up with is an array of one, two, three. So what we want is an array of one, comma two comma three as individual strings in order to do that we just pass in an empty string here and this empty string will basically it says if there's any empty space between characters let's go ahead and separate on that so we end up getting one, two, three. The string converts to strings one, string two, and string three as elements inside of an array. That's great, but now when we iterate over it, we're dealing with strings, we're not dealing with numbers, and we need to be dealing with numbers. So we're gonna go one step further, and we're going to chain another method onto this expression here. So we're gonna say, not method, dot map, and so what map will allow us to do is do something to each of these elements inside of this array. And so we can call the element in stands for number, or actually it's a string at this point, so we'll call it str, or you could call it s, whatever makes the most sense to you. So for each of these strings in this array, 
we want to convert them to a number. So we're actually doing the reverse of what we did in the first step. In the first step, we converted the number to a string. Now we're going through the array of strings and converting each one of these strings back into a number. And so this little one-liner arrow function here basically says for each string element inside this array, one, two, and three, convert that string into a number and then return it into this new array that gets returned. Ultimately, this expression here returns a new array and we assign that to num array, our variable. So now what num array finally looks like, and this one, two, three is just a, a simple example, of course, it could be any number. We have all these different numbers that we pass in in the test cases. So it's gonna be an array of individual numbers that if combined make up the original number that was passed in as an argument to the function. All right, hopefully that makes sense. So the next step is to iterate over this array. And because it's an array, we have the indices that for each number in the array. And so we can iterate over it and we can say, okay, how many times does this index appear inside of this original number? So to do that, you can use a for loop, you can use a for of loop, you can use a for each loop. I'm gonna go ahead and use a for of just because I like that syntax but the, the little gotcha there is that for of doesn't give you an index so we're going to create our own index by initializing a variable called I and setting it equal to zero outside of our loop so now inside of our loop we can do for const num of num array so for each number element inside this array here we'll have access to that number with this variable named num inside of each iteration of the loop. So then inside of here, we can just pseudo code this a little bit. We wanna say check to see, and what we wanna check is we wanna check and see how many times the current index appears in the array and does that total number match the current element that we're on. So for example, one is at index zero. So the index, the number zero should appear inside this array one time. In this case, it does not. In the case of one that's true, it will. All right, so we're gonna check to see how many times the current index appears in the array. And does that total match the current element or number we'll say for this iteration, just to be super clear. All right, so how do we determine how many times the current index appears in the num array? What we can do is we can say num array dot filter, and then for each number, I'll just say n to stand for number, we wanna see if the number is equal to the current index. So remember, we're tracking our index with i here, for the first iteration of the loop, i is equal to zero, and then somewhere inside this loop, we're gonna to need to actually increment the value for i before we go to the next iteration. All right, so if in the number inside the array, it's gonna loop over the entire array and check every single number, if any of those numbers are equal to the current index for this iteration, then it's going to push in into the new array that filter returns. So we can check the length of this to see how many times this condition proves true. And that should match the current num that we're on. So we will go ahead and wrap this in an if statement. So we're saying, hey, if the length of this num array filter is equal to the current num that we're on, that's a good thing, that means that we're at least for this specific number, we have a green light to move on to the next number and continue checking to see if this whole entire number is self-describing. So what we wanna do is continue on to the next iteration of the for loop. So to do that, of course it would happen automatically uh, if we wanted it to. So the way you could structure this differently is what I'm trying to say. But in this case, just to be really explicit, I'm gonna say I plus plus, that's just to, increment i, and that's because we're about to go to the next iteration. And then you can simply do a continue. 
And so continue just means go to the next iteration of this loop. Then there's an else statement here, which basically means that the length of the result of this number a filter did not match the current num. And if that's the case, that means that this number is not self-describing. And so since we're inside of a function, we can short circuit both the loop and the function by returning a value. In this case, we return false because the number is not self-describing. Otherwise, if it was this was true, then we just increment and continue. So then it just goes to the next one. So if one is true, then we go to two. If two is true, we go to three. If three is true, that means all the elements inside the array were true. And so outside this for loop, if we even make it to this line, if we don't get caught up in this else statement at some point, then we can simply return true. And that means that our number is self-describing. If you're going through here at any point and you get false for this, it goes to the else and then it returns false, it's done. It short circuits the whole thing and you're no longer going to be inside the loop. You're no longer going to be inside the function. It's just going to return out to the program saying, hey, this number that you entered that you want us to check is false. It's not self-describing. Okay, let's go ahead and test this real quick. So if I go to my console and clear this out, go back over here and save this code, you can see we have all these test cases here. So we, could, we should get five trues and four falses if this code is working. Go ahead and run it, go to the console. One, two, three, four, five trues, one, two, three, four falses. And that's it, pretty simple. Let's go ahead and do a review and then I can even do a simple refactor and kind of show you what I was talking about a second ago, how you could do it differently. So first of all, there's just so many ways to do this algorithm and that's the same for pretty much any algorithm. There's just so many ways to do it. Um, so if you're on like Leet Code or Code Wars or one of these websites where you're solving algorithms and you get to see how everybody else did it, uh, word of advice, one, don't, don't compare yourself to others thinking like, oh man, they, they did it so much better. Obviously that's a learning opportunity. If you see a solution that you think is better than yours, then just see how they did it and maybe implement that into your solution next time around. But the other thing is a lot of people just try to make it as succinct as possible using like single line, like this This has a couple little single line method chaining in here, but people will go way beyond that. They'll use like regular expressions and whatnot to get like literally just a single line solution. Uh, and that's cool, it's fancy, but it's not necessarily the best solution. Just because there's less code doesn't mean it's better. So if you have to write 30 or 40 lines of code to get this to work, that's totally fine. The important thing is that you're figuring out how to solve this problem in whichever way that you choose. And then later you can always come back and you can refactor it. So for example, a for loop is always going to iterate to the next iteration uh, unless you do something to break out of it or if beforehand you tell it to continue. So that's kind of what we did here. So what we could do is we could say, number a filter length equals num if we could say does not equal num and then that tells us that we need to return false then that gets rid of the else statement if we get to this next line then we know that it actually did equal num and in this case we just need to do an i plus plus and then it'll go to the next line. So yeah, we just carved off a little bit of the code. We no longer need the else statement. We're simply doing the check. We're doing the opposite check to see if the length of the number a filter does not equal the current num that we're on. And if it doesn't, then we know we need to return false. If it does, this never happens. We increment and we go to the next iteration of the loop. So if we run this again, you can see one, two, three, four, five, true, one, two, three, four, false. That means that it's working properly. So you could do this with a, a for loop, with a forwards iterating uh, for loop or a reverse iterating for loop. You could do it with a for each. That way you get access to the index that way. Uh, there's so many different ways to loop and solve this problem. This is just one possible solution. If you, again, if you are not completely clear on what's happening here, uh, I will describe it very quickly one more time before we close out the video. But also I highly recommend that you check out the previous video that I made. I actually have a slide deck where I have like visuals showing you exactly what this algorithm is wanting you to do and the problem that we're solving. So just 
To go over it one more time, if you have a number, for example, 1210, basically what we want to do here is check. We want to assign indices just like we would in an array. So that's kind of why we convert it to an array so that we can loop over it. All right, so first we convert it to 1210. Now it's an array. And we say, okay, the zeroth index in the array, the first index, the second index, and the third index. And now we just do this comparison. So we say, okay, we're at zero. How many times does zero appear? Well, because the element in the zeroth place of the array is one, zero, the index, should appear once inside the number. And so one, two, one, zero, here's that zero, also reflected in our array. That checks out, we go to the next iteration of the loop. And this one, we have the element two that is at the index one. So what are we looking for? We're looking for two of the number one to appear in this number. Sure enough, we have one here and we have one here. So that checks out, green light, go to the next iteration. We have element one at index two. And so that means that the number two, which is our index, should appear one time. Go back through the number, there's that number two, checks out. Finally, element zero at index three means that we should have zero or no threes in this number. Go through it, there's no threes, we're done looping, we're done with the array, everything is checked out, green light, green light, green light, and we return true. If at any point there was something in here that did not match, let's say we had a uh, like a five here or something. And so it says, okay, zero appears one time, that checks out. One should appear five times. Well, that's not even possible because this is only a four character integer, okay? And so that would obviously return false. So that's the flip side of the coin. That's what would break it and return false. The, the other side is that each one of those checks would pass. And then finally, after the looping is done, you would return true. All right, so that is a self-describing number. This is actually a pretty common uh, problem. If you look it up in your browser, you'll find uh, you know other solutions and other prompts describing what's expected. So if you like this type of video, let me know in the comments below and leave a like if you don't mind. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and we will see you guys in the next video. Thanks a lot.